you know, some days I'd go surfing at the pass and uh, I'd go up to my next door neighbour was Garth Murphy and Bill Engler. Yeah. I'd go up and try and get them to come surfing with me and they sometimes, most times would come and do it with me. But sometimes they just would, you know, they had other things they were doing. So I'd go out and I'd surf the pass all on my own, you know, and it would be like four or five feet, you know, and you're just going, <laughs> this is too good to be true, you know, because it's a perfect point break when the sand's right, you know. So I surfed that for a long time there for a couple of years, you know, and then when the surf got really, uh, when the swell got from the south and really big, then, you know, you go down to Lennox Head and, you know, once again, you know, I remember so many days just Russell and Garth and I were the only ones in the water for wow. hours. <laughs> Gosh. It was it was very ideal to have that situation. That's Nat Young. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Cowler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, The Journal delivers 136 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. If you want to learn more, if you'd like to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Quoting here now, there have been other great surfers in the hundred years since this sport was raised from the dead, the Surfers Journal said of Young in 1998, including Duke Kahanamoku, Mickey Dora, Jerry Lopez, Mark Richards, Kelly Slater, and a dozen or so more. But none of them has had the scope and the span or the enduring focus of Nat Young, the most important surfer of the modern era. Unquote. And this is from the writer Drew Campion. For Nat Young, surfing is only part of a much bigger picture. Quite often, it's what matters most, but not always. Indeed, Mr. Young, the self styled icon and tribal elder, the author, publisher, filmmaker, teacher, lobbyist, fashion model, businessman, spokesperson, pilot, gourmand, instigator, theorist, philosopher, yes, surfers do sometimes get wise, surfboard shaper, politician, and skilled practitioner of surfing and other gravitational gratifications, including skiing, river rafting, and windsurfing, is as much a man of the mind as he is a man of the body, unquote. It's a lot. I personally, this is Jamie now, I've read his books, I've watched his films, I've had many interesting conversations with Nat over the years, all of which sets a nice foundation for this episode of Soundings. I first met Nat in the late 80s in France, where the ASP added a longboarding division to the events. I probably did not know the word bon vivant then, but Nat was a bon vivant. He was curious, worldly, he skied in Chamonix, he knew wine. He carried himself in a way that was just really inspiring and engaging. it, It was a kind of an example of what you could become as a surfer and as a traveler. Family plays a big role in Nat's life. His son, Bo, is a two-time world longboarding champ. His son, Bryce, recently dropped a stunning film called Following the Fall Line. And his son-in-law, Taylor Jensen, is a three-time world longboarding champion. Nat had recently undergone a very serious surgery in the U.S., which we talk about in the conversation. We spoke remotely. He at home with his family in Angari on the northern New South Wales coast, and I at home in Malibu. Nat, welcome to the show. Thanks, mate. And what, um, thinking about your your long and celebrated career, what are you most proud of? I think that I documented um, the history of Australian surfing accurately um, in my um, second movie, and I really think that that is... um, that's what I'm particularly proud of on a surfing level. It was a big project, but it came out really good, and I'm really proud of it still. That's so interesting that you would say that because you achieved so much. You won so many events. You were part of a huge movement in surfing, which we will get to in this conversation. But then you also sort of transitioned 
into writing and making films and documenting the culture. And, and given that your nickname was the animal at the height of your career, the animal and the, per, and the kind of thinking, the facilities that you would bring into documenting surf culture, they're almost two different things in so many ways. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, well, you know, the thing is that I had a, uh, I had a manager. Well, I had two managers, really. A guy called Bob Evans, who you probably know his name. Yeah. He was the first and celebrated um, surf movie maker in Australia. He was he was sort of it on his own for so long. And he um, introduced me to a guy called Richie Benno, who was another person that's passed since. But he was a great Australian cricketer. And, um, you know, I mean, I could go on about sort of what he achieved as a cricketer, but he, in Australia, he was regarded as one of the absolute um, finest. And so he, um, he gave me, he sort of took me under his wing and out of the end of that discussion or several weeks of discussion about how you can achieve, um, uh, well, how you can really achieve some length to your career, you know, and he was the one who told me that. Well, firstly, you've got to uh, you've got to write um, you've got to write a how-to book. So I did a book called um, you know um, uh, Surfing Fundamentals, and uh, basically sold that to a publishing company, and uh, that did very well for us. You know, like I think about fifty thousand copies around the world. It was good. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, you know, he said, well, you've got to do now, you know, you've done that, you how to. Now what you've got to do is you have to uh, uh, do the history of the sport. And so that's how I got into uh, a, a book called The History of Surfing. Yeah, interesting. Your history book I know well, and I've referenced it for things I've written over the years. And I think the one of the things that's really great and, and also interesting about that is you sort of you you lived it. You were you in many in many instances you were at the forefront of the very history that you would later be documenting, and so you had. Um, I imagine writing about it, you had this kind of conviction, you know, firsthand immersion. You were able to you knew it. Now, who could ever argue with it when you actually were living in the, in the thick of it? And so, getting to that, I know that you grew up in Sydney and 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 learned to surf around Collaroy. I think from what I know, one of the one of the first hugely impactful things that you did was winning the 1966 World Championships in uh, San Diego on a board called Sam that would, to my mind, change surfing forever. Can you talk a little bit about the 1966 World Championships and uh, as well as the, the board and that type of surfing that you were doing? Well, I was very influenced by, um, I'd spent a lot of time that winter before up in, um, up in Caloundra and uh, Noosa Heads and I'd really learnt, uh, uh, I'd learned how to surf in a certain style, you know, it's particularly with that board, you know, with Sam and, uh, you know, the, the style was, it, it had no kick in the nose. And the board was really flat, but you know, and, and I, you know, I shaped it so I know exactly what I was trying to do. But the thing was that it it um, it planed really fast, but it really it was very uh, unforgiving. So you had to really know what you're doing to surf the board, and um, and I knew what I was doing because I shaped it, as I said. So I had a really good time with uh, with uh, Mick Tavish and also a guy called Russell Hughes, and we were up in. Um, up in Noosa, and uh, uh, Greeno was there too, you know, and so was uh, so was a guy called Algie Grud, you know. There was a few of us. And there was only like probably a half a dozen of us that were there, and we had a great time, you know. And um, you know, I did a lot of a uh, lot of surfing with uh, Bob and George, and that was sort of probably the best uh, the best introduction that I could get to being ready for the World Championship because then. We went over to California with. Um, I went over with um, with John Witzig, who's still my closest friend, and his um, and uh, another guy called uh, what was his name? Oh, Ted Wilson. Mm -hmm. So Ted was the one who um, uh, came over there as the judge from Australia. So we had a really good time. We went up and stayed at George's house at the start, 
and in Montecito, and that was great because then we got to surf the ranch and ring on, and you know, and I, you know, well, you know what that's like, just mm-hmm. to be in that position to surf uh, waves like that. And um, you know, there's a couple of really nice pictures of me surfing the ranch that I always really thought were just um, you know complete classics. You know, not not anything like the um, incredible surfing that is done these days by you know by John John or any other people that are really on that level. But you know, like for for where we were at at that time, you know, it was um, fantastic just to surf with. You know, we were surfing with two other guys, the, the Hazard brothers. That was it. You know, wow. and we'd go up there every day and to surf the, you know, surf rights and lefts. When it got better, we'd go and surf, um, you know, surf coho, and you know, it was, it was an amazing time. We were only there for like ten days or two weeks or something. Then we went back to, we drove down to uh, to San Diego and. Um, you know, and I, you know, I thought I had a pretty good chance because I was I was surfing really well, I think, you know, and um, I didn't have a problem with um, with competing. It was I'd been competing really a lot before that contest, and um, you know, but I I, I thought that um, I thought that David Nueva would probably win because um, he was so good on the nose, you know, and. And, and those boards that we were riding, I mean, like Sam was not a really good nose riding board because it was too narrow in the nose, you know. Mm-hmm. But it did have a big, um, a, a big rear end, so it would slow, you know, it would st- stay in the water. And I had a really good time watching, watching Nueva surf uh, one day at um, where was that? You know, I'm just trying to, I can't think where it was, but I think it was right around Del Mar. Okay. And he was just like unbelievable how good he was, you know. I mean, that's how, how talented he was. And um, that to me was a big turn on, you know. Right. But you, what, here, here's a question I would ask you is, you know, I came to surfing in the late 70s and the, and the kind of, there was longboarding absolutely that existed. And I saw it at First Point Malibu when I was a kid. But then, I, then up at Third Point, just, you know, a little bit further up the point was the up, down, up, down style of surfing. And I'm, I'm guessing when you, when you shaped your board, Sam, and when you brought that, that style that we'd later know of as the involvement approach to surfing, you know, what you described that Nueva was nose riding, right? So he was drawing more of a straight line. No one was going up and down on a wave the way you started to, and then kicking off this entire shortboard revolution. Was that something that you saw in your head? Was it something that the waves called for and you went you know what i need to make the board smaller i need to stomp the tail and i need to be turning and doing that style i mean what as a pioneer of that i'm so curious as to like sort of how you found your way into what would be this this like entirely groundbreaking approach to riding a wave well you know i gotta say that it it all came from george greener like there's no way if anybody ever tells you different tell them they don't know the history of this whole activity because basically George was the one that could surf further back in the curl than anybody else, either on a mat or on, a, on one of Villa's, on one of his boards. So um, he was the one that sort of inspired me. And all that time up there in Alexander Headlands and Noosa, I mean, I, I was just floored by some of the situations. I mean, we had good swell. It was the end of winter and uh, there was tons of good swell. And, and you know, he was just really um he, he was all over it you know like he was just sort of like you know george, george is a unique character that's for sure you know i mean i still speak to him at least once a week we've got really and he tells me really good stories about what's happened what he's what the latest thing that he's actually caught and it's, you know i'll tell you one story that i wanted to get out anyhow so i might as well get it out right now he yeah. um he didn't call me about uh, it was about probably a month ago, and, you know, he's, he's old, you know, he's like 70, 70, uh, or well, whatever he is now, 75, 70, yeah, someone around 76, and he didn't call me, and, I, and he always calls at like 10 o'clock. He's very, very punctual when he has, you know, your connection, and he didn't call, so I thought, well, Jesus, that something's gone on, you know, like he's either been <laughs> eaten by one of those sharks or something diabolic has happened to, you know, and so I called McTavish, you know, because I, Bob, I, you know, and I are still close. And I said, um, 
can you go over and see what's going on with, um, with, with George? I said, I haven't heard from him all day, you know, and I said, it's kind of freaking me out, you know. So he said, oh, yeah, I, I see, I'm sure he's okay now. And I'll go. So he went over there and he, um, and then he called me back about an hour later and he, he got, when he got back to his house, he said, oh, George is fine. Nothing's wrong there. He said he's going to call you in another 20 minutes or so. He's just got some big deal going on. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, like, so I, I sort of hung around and waited and called and he said, um, I said, well, what's the big deal that you didn't call me? And he said, well, the big deal is that I just sold um, uh, one of my um, knee boards, one of, the, one of the villas, he said, for 10000 bucks to a guy from New Zealand who had been pestering me. Hmm. He said, I didn't want to sell it. You know that? And I said, no, of course you didn't want to sell it. He said, so, um, he said, so I got the board and I... Um, I, uh, I, I, you know, he came with it and I told him to bring it in cash. So the guy bought the cash to George's house, you know, so George has got the 10,000 bucks. And then, and then George says, okay, fine. I, I don't really want your money. He said, I want you to come with me and I'll show you what I'm going to do with your money. <laughs> so he goes down to the, the, uh, the Westpac helicopter service, which saves everybody on this coast. I mean, it comes... It's the only um, surf life saving that really works. Good, nice, big uh, helicopters, and they really, you know, but they run out of money all the time. So George said, George has given them, he walk, they love him. He walked into their office in Ballina, he gave them the 10,000 bucks, and they, wow. and they loved it. And so uh, George is now another supporter of the Westpac helicopter service. But he'd already given him money before, you know. I mean, that's just what he does, you know. He's just – Yeah, it's so I cool. mean, of course, George George is pretty wealthy. A lot of people don't know that he actually came from pretty a pretty wealthy background. Yeah. But, I mean, he didn't, he didn't want it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, I took you off the course, so, yeah, yeah you can get back to them. It's so where cool. you want to get to, Jamie. It's so interesting, and I, it, it, I, it, I love hearing you – kind of give it all up to to George and George was a kneeboarder and also a mat rider but never a stand up surfer is that correct well, I think he did for a little while he had I think he had a couple of goes and reckoned it was no, it wasn't his it wasn't his cup of tea he's a he's a unique character this guy and I tell you but it's interesting that in many ways the, the the if there was a sort of message being conveyed through that it was like this lower center of gravity that maybe the longboarding style did not do because I think a lot of more high performance surfing requires you to kind of compress a lot more than than yeah. nose riding does no it's true but I mean you know I guess it's um you know, I mean, of course, you can't compress to the same degree that somebody does on a kneeboard or on a or on a mat. You know, so you know we're limited in our. As soon as you stand up, you're limited in that uh, in that capacity. But you know, it, it, it's fine. You know, I mean, I think I think we all just sort of uh, wrestle with uh, with the whole thing. Standing up is a really interesting thing. I mean, you know, I don't know. You know, you're not old enough yet, but once you start to get to um, Seventy seems to be the big uh, the, the big cutoff point um, because I, you know I have several different friends in Australia that and also in America that call me and say we can't stand up we can't get up quick enough anymore yeah and it's it's really hard to get up really fast you know and I, I you know that's that's the big problem you know to me as you get older yeah to be able to surf so that's why. You know, George wants me to go up there. In fact, he wants me to go up there tomorrow to get to get a map because after my injury, I can't really get up at all. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to be even in the water. Right. So my uh, what I've got to do is so uh, I'll probably go and get a mat and get some fins and have a go with that one on the George Greeno style because you know he uh, he's been a hell of an influence throughout my life. Well, there's the expression, it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees, but maybe after the age of 70, it's better to lay on your belly or than not get in the water at all. Well, you know, I don't know about you. I don't know how many people you know that that's, that's, that scenario is true, but around here, just in the area here, most of the people over 70 have stopped surfing Yeah, because they can't get up quick enough. Yeah, for sure. 
I see a lot of that. Um, Nat, jumping back into the history. So you win the 1966 world titles, and then there's this kind of super fertile period where you're going to Honolulu Bay, the boards are getting shorter, surfboards started to be called pocket rockets. I think Drew Campion had written something about, you know, if your imagination could do it, you could with your board at that point. What was that like? What was the... um, I mean, I'm imagining a lot of psychedelics. It wasn't, I don't think it was any coincidence that it coincided with the psychedelic revolution, the summer of love. But what was it like that time when you were really just going to totally new new parts of the wave with on a surfboard? Yeah, well, it was because of the surfboards. You know, the surfboards were really um, very, uh, very restrictive. And you can, you know, you had to surf them in a certain style. I mean, the thickest part of the board was the very back, and it was a really deep V, you know, like a, you know, a, this is the V bottom era. And, you know, like I, uh, you know, we, I mean, basically, this is really where Bob McTavish really contributed totally to it. You know, Bob was on this this thing, and he was the one who sort of, um, where, that was another whole trip, but, you know, when, when we, uh, we were all back in Sydney and Bob was working for one of the manufacturers and, you know, he, he, he sort of stumbled upon, or well, didn't stumble, I think he just sort of decided that, you know, the best way to do this was to uh, really, um, was to use the really deep V. And, and um, so he did, you know, and I mean, and I basically, uh, I basically copied Bob, you know. Hey, Bob, Bob, Bob would come around and tell me, you know, you know, you can make that deeper, you can make it, and the thing is that the boards really, um, well, I mean, you've seen all the stuff of Honolulu Bay. I mean, everybody's seen that, you know. I mean, if you look at it carefully, you can see that the, the back of the board is actually breaking loose when you're turning on the bottom of some of those waves. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it was a great period, but I think that they were really restrictive, you know. That, I mean, it was, it was just a part of the evolution, you know. Um, I, I didn't, um, I, I love surfing them, but I also knew that, you know, they had their limitations, you know, you could, you could feel it, you know, and you be, well, you know what it feels like when the back of the board breaks out mm-hmm. and, you, yeah. and you're hanging on by the, just that part of the rail doesn't make you feel too, uh, well, you just don't feel too confident, do you? you right, know? right, so right. That was good. Yep. And so from there, you... And and I know of it more from the history book. So forgive me if I if I put these tag names that don't fit. But I think of it as the country soul period where you moved to northern New South Wales, the the Byron Bay area, and you were not competing as much as I re- recall or as I know it. And you were shaping your own boards, growing your own food, and riding all those great right hand point breaks. What was what was that period like? Well, that was a great period because um, well, Byron Bay is you know. An unbelievably beautiful place, as you know very well. But the problem there was that it had, uh, it used to be all cedar. It used to be all beautiful big, big trees everywhere, but they were all cut down, uh, and you know, and it ended up as farming country, and you know, and, and farming and, and cattle were really the, um, and also dairy dairy cattle. Were, were the whole thing there, and by the time I got there, I didn't get there till um, till after I think about sixty eight, the end of sixty eight, and um, and already um, I had a couple of friends that had already moved there, like uh, Russell Hughes and also uh, um, uh, Garth Murphy, and another guy called Bill Engler. And they'd all moved there and they were all there just before I was there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I was busy trying to find a place to live because I was married by then. And I ended up with um, with a really nice house, you know, an old house, but looking right over Broken Head and the pass and, you know, really was great. And, um, you know, I I don't even know, uh, I don't even know why I sold it, (laughs) but I did. I did because... The bottom line was that I, I didn't really, uh, it just got too crowded for me, you know. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, I had, I had, you know, some days I'd go surfing at the pass and uh, I'd go up to, my next door neighbour was Garth Murphy and Bill Engler. 
Yep. I'd go up and try and get them to come surfing with me. And they sometimes, most times would come and do it with me. But sometimes they just would, you know, they had other things they were doing. So I'd go out and I'd surf the pass all on my own, you know. And it'd be like four or five feet, you know, and you're just going, <laughs> and, and, you know, you're going, this is too good to be true, you know, because it's a perfect point break when the sand's right, you know. So I surfed that for a long time there for a couple of years, you know. And then when the surf got really, uh, when the swell got from the south and really big, then, you know, you go down to Lennox Head and, you know, once again, you know, I remember so many days just Russell and Garth and I were the only ones in the water for wow. hours. <laughs> Gosh. It was it was very ideal to have that situation. And, then, you know, it was probably um, never to be repeated for anybody really. That any, you know, people didn't have that um, it just wasn't going to be possible anymore because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but there was like, I remember going to a party uh, down at Broken Head and all of a sudden there was 30 people there that I didn't know at all and they'd all come from America. Uh -huh. They'd all heard about it and they'd all decided that Byron Bay was the spot. Right. And they were all connected on some level to somebody who was living there but, it was just got it just got too uh, cosmopolitan for me. Uh huh. I mean, and that's when that's when I I sold that place. Okay. And I moved to a, a big big ranch. Um, it's like six thousand acres. Hmm. That was a real fertile peri period again, a kind of revolution in board design, and you were shaping your own boards. And Garth Murphy, who's our mutual friend, he's told me the story of going over to see you, and you'd be shaping outdoors in the nude, with you know running the planer up and down the board. Did you did you actually shape in the nude, naked? Well, I think I had some undies on. Okay, but <laughs> well, you can't get your you know you don't want to get your dick caught in the tail plane, you know. Right. With the but I don't think that you know. But I had a you know. It's true. I had a really nice, uh, a nice, well, just a shed, but I could shape, you know, I could shape Russell's board and Garth's board and Bill's boards and my boards. And then, you know, all of a sudden we're getting, uh, uh, you know, everybody wanted more boards, you know, because there was more people moved into town. So then I'm really starting to, you know, doing more shaping than I really wanted to do and it changed my whole life from, uh, you know, so I ended up, um, you know, it just it just got too uh, too hectic for me. Mm -hmm. And this was a period where the IPS had yet to form. That was in 1976, and and I guess like at that time, being a being a pro surfer was kind of a very like ambiguous title. Like what? How how did you, how were you, were you earning your money solely off of shaping boards? What how how did you get by? No, not at all. You know, well, up until um, I'm just trying to think of the exact date. But I mean, I, I, I was, uh, I had a contract with uh, Dewey Weber Surfboards that started, I think, at about, mm, I think it started like when I won the World Championship. So it started in 66 and it just kept going um, uh, because Dewey was, Dewey was pretty, very supportive of me and always paid me. And, um, you know, it meant that I could do pretty much. Well, I had the sort of similar freedom to what most of the pros have got these days. You know, they got the money. You can do pretty much anything you want. So um, that's what I had. I had a really nice situation where every uh, every week there'd be another another check from uh, for, from Dewey Weber surfboards. And uh, you know, in the end, you know, as you know, you know, with the the irony of all of that is that you know when the surfboards went smaller, and you know, and, and everything changed. All of a sudden, there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any any market for longboards really, and that mm. meant that we held uh, that that my situation had totally changed, and I and I didn't really, I wasn't getting paid in the end, so I, that's why I kind of uh, it was better to just sort of stay on the farm and do what I was doing on uh, up in Byron with making boards to keep, um, you know, by that stage I had a baby and. I had a wife, so I was trying to support everybody and keep it all running, and it was good. It was a good thing. And and from there, I think I I first met you. It would have been in the late eighties. You your sponsor was Oxbow in France, and the the ASP had introduced a longboard division to the events, 
at least the French <laughs> events, maybe not all the events, but I remember there was the French leg and you would be there. Joel, the, a very young Joel Tudor was there, but then there that you had this sort of like this uh, second wind, I guess you might call it, or this, this thing, you were probably what, 40 at the time or so, and you were a world champion, right? Yeah. Well, that all happened. I thought it was all over, you know, and there were a couple of people that were very instrumental who were very strong in the ASP, you know, and the guy from Cronulla. Graham Cassidy? Graham Cassidy, exactly. Yeah. That's good. You good that you're on the on the ball. Hmm. Um, there, Graham, and he had a um, he he came to see me, and I think I was living at Palm Beach at that stage, and he said, "We've got to broaden this whole thing with the ASP out, and how we should broaden it is through the longboard thing to give a sense of history and a whole different style of surfing." Graham was a you know a journalist for the Sunday one of the Sunday newspapers. Yeah, and he was a, he was a he was a good journalist, but he was primarily a surfer who'd been dropped into a position to be the head of the ASP. So, you know, he's trying. I must have been a hell of a wrestling point for him trying to be head of the ASP, do his journalist work. You know, like I mean, ugh, I hate to think how, but he pulled it off. And so what happened was that um, Graham came down and so did uh, Claw, Doug, uh, Doug Warbrick. Yep, from Rip Curl, yeah. Because he was a, he was a heavy uh, mover and shaker in the whole, um, well, you know, they were, as, you, as you know, they sponsored the first pro contest, the one at Bells Beach. So, so Rip Curl was, um, or Doug Warbrick was very involved in all of that. And he was also a longboard surfer. So he had a very good understanding of how different it was and the fact that we could create something that was going to be um, a, separate, um, a separate discipline, a separate style that was going to be really create a, a valid form of surfing for commercial, you know, on a commercial level. And basically, um, well, Graham and, and Claw both said to me, you know, we'd like you to be the front runner for this, you know, to get involved and start to compete again. And I said, well, you know, okay, that's that's not too hard to do because, I'm, you know, I love it. I love the whole idea of, you know, and I was already surfing longboards pretty heavily then. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did, you know. I got into it um, on that level. We, got, we started to do sort of, uh, you know, we, the idea is Graham could um, tell you more about this but basically, because I don't know what the ins and outs of it were, I just know that he ended up saying um, what we can do is um, every time we have a shortboard contest, we're going to have a longboard contest and we'll, we'll handle the sponsors to be able to get them to put it on. And I just thought that was going to be an amazing thing if they could pull it off, but they, they did pull it off for a while. Yeah. Um, I think everybody really enjoyed it, you know. I mean, you know, it was around the world. <laughs> no, I certainly did. And it's, it's funny because of, of, of course I knew who you were, but I think I first met you at that time. And it was during the French leg of the events, there'd be the longboard heats happening in, in sometimes like big, heavy beach break waves that were more friendly for shortboarding than longboards. But it was so cool. Possible. It was so great having you around because I think at that time, kind of similar to what you said earlier about not, you know, the WSL right now, not paying homage to the history of the sport. You were there as a, as this sort of ambassador, and I remember, I remember having conversations with you, and you talked about going to restaurants and drinking wine, and there was this cultural element that a lot of us younger, you know, pro surfers were were living in this sort of bubble with the blinders on, and we weren't really interested in in the broader stuff. And you were, and it was it was great to see that. And then on the same note, you know, Joel came in, and Joel was just this young kid who revered you guys so much, and so he got to have this sort of mentorship through through yourself, and and he was almost like passing it along to his generation that there there are these other things that matter than you know what the short the shortboard pursuit was sometimes so narrow. It was great in the in the in the service of high performance surfing, it was fantastic, but in in service yeah. of the larger culture, it was kind of living in a vacuum and. 
the long, you know, I'm watching Joel's trajectory and and being friends with him, uh, he's always had this sort of broader sense of of surf culture, surf history. But you were you were yes, um, he, does. he has yeah. But you were you were a part of that, and and so what was that like for you to kind of I guess come into it later and maybe m- wonder if you're if you were still relevant in the, on the on the on the board so to speak, and you suddenly are world champion again. Yeah, well. Um... Well, Boris is a classic, you know. He's always been a classic. Who's Boris? He's Boris is uh, Boris the Clitoris. It's uh, it's Joel. Okay, that was my name for Joel. I didn't forever. know. I didn't know that. Yeah, no. He, well, you you caught, you tell him that next time you speak to him. Say so Nat said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had a really good time with Oxbow, and he was just sort of, you know, I can tell you so many stories that I don't even know where to start. You know, like. Um, my my boss at Oxbow um, decided that um, that Boris should be, um, you know, we, we had this giant poster you know, just off the train station at uh, in Biarritz, like a huge poster, like you know, probably twenty four feet wide by ten foot wide, ten foot high, and we used a picture of Boris, but we wanted to make it so as it really stood out, and we used it. He had him wear a pink wetsuit. I remember. Did you ever see that? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and, you know, basically Boris is pretty conservative when it comes to that stuff. He would rather just be wearing a black wetsuit. <laughs> but he, but my boss, uh, Isabel, she, uh, she had the opinion that we had to really have, that he had to have a pink wetsuit on. And uh, and he did it, and it looked really good, you know. But he was he was he was classic, you know. I mean, I still love Boris. We did some really good, fun things together, you know. It, when they did, we did a tour of of Europe with uh, you know, Takushi Masuda and uh, Bo, and uh, you know, and you know, and Boris, of course, and you know, we and 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 Dwayne, I think, and then we all um, they were all all performed so well with this thing, you know, we had it, we ran through Italy and up through Spain and up through, you know, we did everywhere, you know, and it was basically putting on surfing, um, teaching people to surf, basically. Yeah. Yep. We were out in Sardinia. Yep. And so what we ended up doing was um, I took them all to Amsterdam. My boss said, you know, like we can have a, you know, have a few days in Amsterdam as a present for them all being so, so wonderful. So you can imagine what happened there. It right. Was, you know, Amsterdam's a hell of a place to go. And we had a really good time. It's so funny because nowadays uh, with marijuana being legalized in so many places, it's not such a big deal. But back then that was like the one little place where you could, the safe haven where you could, you know, go to a coffee shop and get a bunch of pot and get high and exactly. do whatever else that comes after that. Yeah, well, there was one guy, that uh, Anjo, who owned um, all the surf shops in, um, in that town originally. He was a, you know, and he, uh, he, he was, impre- you know, we were all sitting down. We just had dinner. He had a beautiful restaurant. And then he said, uh, he said, so Nat, what's your, what's your favorite pot? And I said, uh, I said, I don't know, you know, I mean, you know, I can give you a name of, uh, you know. And he said, well, you know, tell me what do you think is the best pot in the world, you know. And I said, okay, Durban Poison. And he said, from what year? And I said, well, I don't know it very well, so I'll just say 67. And he said, okay. So come with me. He took me into his, his cellar, which was all, you know, everything was packed totally in, in, in cry, not cry bags, but in actually vacuum bag situations. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, he said, let me find it, you know. So he goes, well, and he had every year from Afghanistan, from different parts of the world, he had them all in cry packs. And he said, he said, so, so 60, 67 Durban poison, right? He said, I, I, I've got a 66, well, that, you know, I mean, this guy's treating it exactly like wine. You yeah, know? I was going to say. so I was loving it, you know. So we went up there and we, and, uh, you know, we all enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the fruits of his labor and, and had a really nice, uh, 
we stayed up all night, actually, which was pretty good fun, as you know. No, I remember that period so well. And I was always kind of um, envious because as a short border and someone who was just trying to stay on tour and trying to basically break into the top 30 and then the top 16, I, I, I had the kind of blinders on. I was trying to live this athlete's life, which was which was kind of saying no to a lot of the peripheral stuff. or I, well, I shouldn't call it peripheral. That's disrespectful. All the great cultural stuff around it. And I was trying to stay in the competitive bubble. And watching you guys, I think you were maybe just by virtue of the fact that you were on the longboards tour and maybe there was there was less at stake in terms of the prize money and all that. Um, all of my friends who, who rode longboards or my friends who were free surfers as opposed to competitive surfers were able to kind of have a lot more fun and their their view was broader and and um and the point of traveling to these places was to really just like embrace all of it versus trying to stay in this little bubble that the that the competitor does you know i think that's true uh, uh and i think that's true of even uh, these days you know yeah although i don't i don't, I don't know and as i said before i don't know anything about it these days other than what taylor tells me you know and that's you know, I would like to think that um, the idea of, of longboard surfing can be really um, still, you know, the, still tradition and style, you know, yeah. which is what they're sort of, and, and I must say that that's when you, um, I was listening to it the other day um, in Malibu and um, and, and, and that that is sort of like what they're talking about as a criteria. So I think that's, that's a good direction, you know, yeah. because it should be based on style and it should be based, you know, I mean, th the things with uh, with longboard surfing is really, uh, you know, is, should be as unique as, as shortboard surfing, mm -hmm. you know, but it shouldn't be the same. Yeah. You know? It shouldn't be. And that's why the nose riding is important and that's right, you know, the turns where you're really <clears> – <throat> You know, I love to, I love to watch good longboard surfing. I love to watch good surfing in general. You know, that's what where you get to when you start to, you know, seventy five. I just want to watch. I want to watch it. Yep, <laughs> yep. Having watched a lot, who are the surfers you most um, enjoy watching right now? Well, that's a hard one, yeah, but um, I must say, you know, because then you'd always break it down to you know giant waves or yeah. normal small waves. You know, because you know. I mean, I love to watch. I was watching the other day some stuff of Kai Lenny, and it's just incredible. You know, yeah. I mean, he's amazing. You know, and then if I you know, and then you know, the, the same with um, with with all of the shortboarding. And I mean, I still think that um, that on a longboard, that uh, you know, of course, I'm most impressed by um, uh, and, well, by Taylor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because I think he does more critical better turns and i don't and i think that you know in the last competition that i watched i don't think he was given the credit for the turns that he was doing you know mm -hmm. from my point of view yep you know taylor being your son-in-law and then your your son Bo is also a world longboarding champion and then your yeah. son bryce just put out this amazing film it's it was really cool watching bryce's film because having seen many clips of you surfing and Gary and then seeing Bryce, I can absolutely see this sort of genetic connection of the style. Um, oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's so interesting that, I mean, obviously we, we carry, we, there, there's a physical likeness of a father and a son, but it's really interesting to see it sort of translate into riding a surfboard. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that's not the first time I've heard that, but I mean, we, I'm really, uh, of course, I'm really proud of him, and he gets, he he, he does get, you know, he, he's a really, uh, you know, he, he has, he's had some really good sponsors, so he's done very well for himself, you know. Mm -hmm. He's got a nice house. He's got a, he's got two nice boats that he can, you know, surf down in the national park any time he wants, you know. So he's he's in really good shape as um, financially, which is making it really nice for him as a uh, as a pro surfer. Because he can surf pretty much any time he wants, you know. Mm. Although, and then you you know you're suffering all the problems of being a, uh, a surfing to that degree, um, where there's always um, there's always incidents and accidents that come up. You know, I mean you're always you're always getting banged up. It seems you know. Yeah. I mean, 
and Bryce pushes it probably more than anybody that I know, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so all the time it's sort of like there's a, it's an edge, you know. It's a, it's, it's, and I, I uh, but you can't change that, you know. He's going to surf how he surfs, you know. Yeah. And sometimes the wheels come off, but most times they stay on and it works good. Yep. Um, Nat, having seven-ish decades of surfing under your belt, what is there? I know I started this conversation asking you, what are you most proud of? But was there a period where you felt kind of most like in the groove, most um, at the height of your powers as in your surfing specifically, like just riding waves? What what period stands out as as you expressing yourself as as purely as 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 you can? Well, I, I I think the stuff, you know, I mean, the, the stuff in Morning of the Earth, you know, on those classic pintail boards is the, um, I think that was the pinnacle of my surfing ability, you know. And that, that I don't know, you know, I guess that was, uh, I was trying to think what it was, S- probably 1970, 71, mm-hmm. you know, right around there, you know. Yep. And I. I just think that I, I couldn't put a foot wrong then, you know, and I was in a really good place and I was shaping all of the surfboards for friends and doing my own surfboards and changing things all the time, you know. Like I'd, I'd build a board, uh, you know, I remember one board I did, I never did, didn't know what happened to it, but it was, I used a, um, uh, I, I used balsa on the bottom of it and, and shaped the whole bottom of it and then put a graft of, of um, uh, a, a graft of foam on top for flotation, hmm. and the board went incredibly well. You know, wow. like balsa's got a whole different feel to it. You know, it's just it's a different way. You've probably never surfed a balsa. I don't think so. I have. I don't, I don't believe that I have. It's a it's a it's a flow. You know, right? It's a different flow. You know what's so interesting though? When I see the when I knowing Morning of the Earth very well, and that's one of my all time favorite surf films. Um, I lived for about three years in Sydney on the northern beaches. I lived in Newport. I knew that. And you know that area well because you were in Palm Beach and Whale Beach, which is very close by, and you know those waves. So after I was on the tour and then I'd spent three years kind of basing myself in Sydney. And then at the end of it, I moved back to Los Angeles. And I moved to Venice Beach and I would go out surfing at Venice every day. And and suddenly my my surfing kind of hit this like it was a big letdown, quite frankly. And I and I came to this obvious thing. It's a it's a very obvious thing, but for me it was this sort of epiphany that is the waves kind of facilitate it and how how engaged and how 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 much joy you can get from your surfing. And so thinking about the northern New South Wales, that period, I mean, what incredible waves you had to to do that stuff you just described, right? Like if if you were there are other parts of the world where you the ocean would not have delivered you up the surf to do that, you know? Probably not, you know. I mean, I, I, we had a really good run with, you know, very few people in the, in the Byron area, you know, and it was I, – I know it's not like that anymore, you know. I mean, it's just a change completely. But I, there was a really good period there where you could really um, – you could pretty much rely on getting really good waves most of the time. And, um, you know, and we were building boards that there was, a, there was a guy that had an influence on me pretty heavily that I'd never really spoken about, a guy called Steve Tiao. And he was from, um, from Maui mm-hmm. um, in those days. And I, uh, he was the one who had shaped a couple of those beautiful um, classic pintails for... Um, for Joey Cabell. Okay. And so he was the one that was telling me that, well, he was the one that shaped, he shaped a board for me and it was really good. And that was sort of the inspiration for all those boards in the boards in Morning of the Earth, the boards, you know, I mean, that was basically what I was doing was just copying whatever Steve Tiao had been uh, schooling me in how to, uh, how to shape those classic pintails. So that was a, that was a great thing for for me as as a surfer, and I think that as you said before, I mean, I think the stuff of me and Morning of the Earth is probably the best surfing that they, you know. I mean, it's not the most critical, mm-hmm. but it's certainly the most um, you know because I see stuff all the time that people, you know, Joel put something up the other day on Instagram, you know, of me surfing 
inside sunset, you know, on a high tide, at, you know, which was great stuff. And I'd never seen it before, mm-hmm. but he had it, you know, and he was he put it out. And I, we spoke to him, Bryce spoke to him, and we still haven't seen it again. <laughs> it was uh-huh. good to see. But he, um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that, uh, I think that uh, the period of morning of the earth uh, was probably the high, mm-hmm. the high point of my surfing ability. Right. Uh, you know, I tend to think that. Yeah. Can you, you showed me just before we, we started this conversation, you showed me your scar on your chest. Um, what, what exactly happened? Um, I was, um, I was invited to go to, um, the snake river to, uh, with these beautiful guns to shoot chucka and pheasant and ducks and birds. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful area on the snake, you know, and, um, you know, and this guy's got a beautiful hunting lodge. And so we went up there and uh, we shot all, you know, and the dogs go out and get the birds and bring them back. And then, you know, like you know, we were hiding in a blind, you know, and it was, it was really a nice experience for me. I mean, I've never, I've never done that before. So it was really, and it was um, you know, quite a pleasure to have it. But I mean, also, um, so then we went back to uh, this guy's house. And we um, we had you know somebody cleaned the ducks, and um, all, all the birds cleaned them and you know prepared them and then cooked them, and then but the problem was that we started this guy had a really impressive cellar, so we started drinking a lot of wine, and I ended up uh, ingesting a whole bunch of buckshot. Oh man! And so and so that and that lodged in my lower intestine so i i went home from a from a dinner that night to my house and incredible pain you know and and so i called ty who was back my wife who was back here in australia and she said well you better uh, you better go to the hospital right now you know you're in, you know sound like you're in serious so i went and did that and they said um they did a scan and they said well there's all this buckshot in there and you know we've got to operate right now you know so that's what they did they um they opened me up like a fish you know and they got all the buckshot out and then uh, you know put me in a position where uh, you know and there, there was a there, there's there's several other things that happened you know i mean i don't know whether you're familiar with what an ileus is a which an ileus means that the bowel actually shuts down okay and, you know, that was so this was after a couple of days. And so that meant that the whole thing, the whole system, my whole system had shut down. Wow. And what had happened was that the, the guy who'd done the cleaning of me with the buckshot had left. Um, how do I say this? Well, he'd, he, he had, he'd cleaned out the buckshot, but he hadn't. Um, or he actually perforated the bowel when he was doing that. So there was like, I think from memory, it was like four or five different places where he'd cut into the bowel when he had me all open. So they sent me in a helicopter to um, Salt Lake City University uh, uh, because they, they thought that the whole thing was getting really messy and I could really die, you know. So they sent me up there to Salt Lake City and then, the Salt Lake City, they had, you know, incredible, because this is all Mormon country, as you know, and they totally uh, pulled it all apart again and um, and cleaned me up totally and um, got rid of and, you know, restitched all of the insides and then put a mesh on the inside to hold it all. And the mesh is still there, I think. Wow. <laughs> and it probably will be there forever. <laughs> and and so anyway, they, they, got, they got me back to a point where I was... Uh, I was in hospital for six weeks. You're an animal, Nat, and I and which leads to where did you get the nickname the animal? Oh, I think it came from um, Paul Witzig's first movie. First movie, I'm not sure. Anyway, he did this movie and he, and he had um, this band called Tannum Shud. Mm-hmm. They're like the Bill Gola Bob band. They they were really good on the northern beaches in the old days, mm-hmm. and so um, I, I think they were the ones that were. Um, uh, commissioned to do a, a um, there was surfing of me at um, 
I think it's Hot Generation, and it's surfing at, um, at Bells Beach, and they had to write a song. And um, this guy, Lindsay Bier, wrote this song called Animal, and that was it. That was it. Okay. That was the start. Of it. Okay. Huh. Um, I love having these conversations so much, Nat, and, and I think um, part of it is because I love surfing so much and I love surf history and surf culture, but I, I also, I always, I always kind of ask myself, why am I doing this? And, and a lot of it is like, I'm just trying to figure out what is the good life, which is the big philosophical question. What is the good life? Like what, what have you learned and what, uh, what can you, what can you, what can you share with us? You've had a big life. Yeah, no, no, I, I, that's 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 my pleasure because I think that um, it's um, there's a couple of things that, that that sort of that that entails, you know, and the first thing is uh, is uh, family first. You have to really consider all of your family. Hurry slowly. That's that's been our family uh, slogan for a long time, and I I still stick stick by it. You know, I just try to be um, I try to sort of give attention to to my friends and to my my family, and um, I don't really get um, I don't have a lot of things that take me away from that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this this you know this year I don't think I'll be traveling. You know, every every year I've been in Indonesia in you know, and all sorts of things since 1972, you know. Wow. And I've got good friends that have got places up there. And I just don't think I can I, – I don't know how it's going to be to travel. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's a good idea to travel like that right now, you know. I think it probably is not a good idea. No, but the rest of the family don't even want, to, want me to go back to America. Hmm. But I probably will mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. because I can't, you know, to give up my life – you know, I mean, I think I skied before this accident. I'd skied eighty-seven days in a row hmm. in the Sun Valley. Wow! And most of it in really good conditions. You know, mm -hmm. it was a good start of the year. But I don't know how it is this year, and I don't. You know, they've just put in a new lift, so that probably will mean that it's going to be more crowded. You know, it's all interesting sort of stuff. Yeah, for but sure. But I think I'm, you know, I think I'm in pretty good shape. I just don't know. Um, I don't know whether I'm in the best shape possible to um, be able to. Um, well, I can't lay on a surfboard. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Okay. I mean, I'm already trying. Bryce and I tried that the other day, and I just no good. Wow. <laughs> you know that cut that period when I think of the kind of shortboard revolution era. Not only was it so important in terms of this sort of design revolution, renaissance, etc., but it was also like I think um, thinking about the country soul. You guys, you know, you moving up to northern New South Wales and sort of just living life on your own terms. There was a level of self reliance. It looks like, um, and you've managed to do that pretty much your entire life. I mean, it seems like you've lived a life very much. You've kind of written it the way you you want does it does it feel that way to you do you feel like you were ducking and weaving and compromising or do you feel like you were able to really stay true to the things that you believed in and and yeah. I, I think i could stay true to the things that i believe in and that means that you know uh staying true to friends you know i mean i've got a couple of really close friends and um you know i feel very fortunate about that you know because that means that you know they're a good a good barometer on what you know what I'm sort of doing, and you know we we have dinner every few weeks, and then talk about things. You know, I mean, I, I my thing right now is I'm doing five k walk every morning. Right? Good before you called this morning. Yep, good. I'd walked five k's. Yeah, good. I have to. Yep, because I have to get my health back. Yeah, I hope you get it back soon. Anything that we haven't touched on that you want to? Well, just sort of. I I got an email from someone yesterday uh, from a mate of mine from Sun Valley and he was up in um, uh, up at Rincon and he was really um, because we put one of the uh, one of the tribal rules up in Rincon have you seen that there that no I haven't well it's a it's it's a, a big uh, it's out of aluminium and also uh, it's got all the it's got all the tribal rules on it you know like and then they're all etched in in aluminium so you can't take them off and the tribal rules happened. are sort of surf etiquette in the water correct exactly 
that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, and Ty and I decided we'd fund this um, because we thought it was important for people to understand what the rules were. So we put them into Japan, put them into France, we did four in France, I think, and we did like 20 of them in here in Australia. And I, I haven't seen them for a while. I mean, I know the one in Byron is still in good shape, someone told me. Uh, there's one at Broken Head, there's one at The Pass. And uh, anyway, the bottom line is that the one in, Mal in, uh, in Rincon has been totally covered in stickers. Wow. You can't even see it anymore. Wow. You know? And it was just such a letdown for me, you know, that people don't appreciate that this is, you know. But, you know, you've got to take that on the chin, haven't you? you know? Jeez. So. But the stickers is so symbolic because it's kind of like commercialism just covering over these, like, tribal rules, right? <laughs> it's like, exactly. it's kind of perfect. Totally. Totally. All, and all gone, you know. And I'm sure that, you know, when you've got people that are going to um, that are gonna listen to this, they're going to go, oh, I saw that. You know, I didn't realize it was anything other than just, you know, 50 stickers all over. And, I mean, these things are like seven, eight foot tall, you wow. know, and look like a surfboard, you know. And, when, you know, and it cost us quite a bit of money to get the frames to actually support them, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's just unbelievable some of the things that happen in your life where you just go, you try your hardest and then, you know, it goes wrong. But basically, um, yeah, well, well that, that's it, you know. No, and that, that but that, that's a great one. That, that's like a great anecdote that leads to a big question, which was, which might be a good one to sign off on. And that is having come to surfing in the late 50s, I believe it was. Yep. Um, looking at it now, what do you think? When you think of what, where you started and what it is today, what, what's your general impression? My general impression is that there's too many people surfing, <laughs> and, and but there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, hey, you know, we had it really good, and it was really good for a long time without. You know, I mean, I just think of those days that I told you about in Byron Bay, where there was just there was two of us surfing the pass, and it's six foot. You know, I mean, you just you know, it just doesn't happen. Any any of that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. You know, what you've got is a situation where you know, uh, you know, you have to really give much more than you take these days yeah. because there's so many more people. So you can't, like, out here at the point, I, I, you know, there was a problem there, you know, three or four days ago, you know, like somebody drops in on somebody and then somebody smashes this person, you know. I mean, it's just, and it, that's the ugly side of surfing, but it does it does happen, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I don't know what you can ever do about it. All I know is that um, we have to try and, uh, well, that's why I just hope that those you know, tribal rules or surface, surface rules were, that it might have a bit of an effect. And they tell me in Sydney and places like, that it has had an effect on the Gold Coast too. But, I mean, I don't, I don't know because I don't travel so much anymore, you know. I can't travel. Right. So I don't really know what's going on with all of that stuff. I don't, I don't surf. I surf Rincon a lot when I was younger. I don't surf it much these days. But if I do surf it soon and I see the stickers, I'm going to peel them off. I don't think you could, Jamie, <laughs> because there's so many of them. <laughs> Incredible. Um, well, thank you, Nat. Great speaking with you. And I hope I get to see you soon. And I hope you get better real soon. Hey, thank you very much, Jamie. All right. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissett, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our theme song is Give Me Away by Asuka Matsumiya and Paz Lenchanton. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication, made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. The journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening to Soundings. We appreciate you. And until next time.